Matthew Weiss here, weiss-sound.com, and now Weiss Advice here on YouTube. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Black Box HG2 from Analog Designs and Plugin Alliance. I am a saturation guy. I rarely run into a distortion that I don't like. Bad distortion, I'll find a use. Good distortion, I'll find a use. This definitely falls into the latter category. It's a really great sounding saturation plugin, and there are many, many, many ways that I use this plugin. I'm only going to show you one, <laughs> sorry about that, but in my opinion, it's the most interesting and one of the most inspiring ones that I employ, and so I figured it would be good to demonstrate it. All right, so the basic idea is this. When I was younger, my taste was really influenced heavily by like 90s hip hop, and very specifically, there was this quintessential 90s hip hop low end that... You know, it varied from record to record, but there was always this tendency for it to be gluey yet punchy, have this like really printed tone, but still be clear and still be audible. There was like separation and togetherness. And I think that it came from just people messing around with hitting the console a little bit hard, uh, recording down to tape machines that were maybe not like the, the most highly specced tape machines, uh, early digital converters that had all sorts of interesting artifacts, or just maybe really pushing out the MPC or ASR-10 outputs really hard, and then all those distortions kind of coming together to form one, like, saturated sound that builds on itself and builds on itself and builds on itself. It just sounds awesome. And basically what I like about it is that the low end, when it's put into that context, can form this, like, bed, this support for everything else in the mix to sit on top of, and it will never ever sound thin. So I'm going to play a little bit of this record and we are going to recreate that idea. So this beat was produced by Armageddon from Terror Squad. I'm going to put a link to his Instagram in the description below. In addition to being a really fantastic producer and rapper, he also does a lot of other things like designs clothing and does fitness training. And he's just, it's a really, he does cool stuff. So when I listen to this beat, I, I love the beat. I think it's an awesome beat. But it is apparent to me that this was done in something like FL Studio or some other kind of digital sequencer that's really just regurgitating the sample rather than being played out on like an MPC where there's the velocity and also the distortion and the crunch and all those kinds of things. So what I want to do is give it that feel of coming off of the MPC, going into the old school digital converters or, or you know, whatever was going into that sound. So I'm pulling up the, uh, the black box here. And here's my goal. I want to get as much tone into the sound over the entire low end, but take away as little of the punch as possible. So it's a sort of strange process, and it takes a second to kind of get an ear for it, but I'm going to walk you through it, and it's, it's just really cool. So first of all, I have all of my low end elements specifically going to one bus. All the basses, all the kicks, anything that's living in the low end. If you've got 808s in the mix, the 808s will go there. And they come down to one bus as opposed to drums going to their own bus, basses going to their own bus. So it's a slightly different way of configuring the submix groups. On that low end bus, that's where we're doing the processing here. So I'm going to play through the low end real quick in solo, and then I'm going to bring on the black box, and we're just going to hear what it does just by turning it on. And not for nothing, honestly, just turning it on sounds good. Like it's a subtle tone, but it kind of lifts the kick a little bit. It brings everything a little bit forward and, and it's nice. So, you know, honestly, we're off to a good start because just turning the darn thing on <laughs> already works. Uh, there is this random channel thing down here at the bottom that I suggest playing around with. Every one of these channels has a slightly different sound. For low end stuff, I tend to like channel three and four, but it's very subjective. I mean, the, the differences are there, but whether or not one's better than the other becomes very ambiguous very quickly. But I'm going to go with three and four because that's just my tendency and what I've found for my own personal flavor. 
Okay, so basically what I'm going to do now is I'm going to drive this thing as hard as possible and it's going to get a lot of tone, but we're going to lose a lot of the dynamics. And you're going to think that I'm terrible at my job because it's not going to sound right. But that's okay because that's only the first half of the equation. The second half and the real magic of it is going to come down to this lower right panel which allows me to control the density, which is going to allow me to increase or decrease the dynamic effect of the black box independent of the saturation. And also this parallel mix in case I want to bring a little bit of like the leading edge of say the kick back into things. So that's the ultimate trajectory of this. So the idea, get as much tone in as possible and then fix the dynamics after. A little strange. Okay, so first of all, to keep things centered on the low end, I like to start with this parallel saturation, which is this first knob here on the left. I'm gonna solo it up, I'm gonna put on a low pass on the parallel saturation, and we're going to center our tone just on the deep lows. So if I go down to like 360 hertz, that's where I start to lose the punch of the kick. And the name of this game is to keep the punch of the kick. So I'm going to turn it up a little bit from here. I want to hear the full excursion of the kick, but I want my, my low pass set as low as possible where I'm still hearing that knock. So it's about 500 hertz in this particular case, and I tend to do this with a pretty gentle slope. 60 dB, 60 dB per octave does the job. So that's gonna be my parallel saturation. Now, we don't need much of this. I'm gonna start it at 25. Normally for a process like this, I would start it at zero and bring it in, but it's going to then feed the later gain stages. So I wanna start with some of it in. Like I said, this is it takes a little bit to get this process down. Okay. Let's take it out of solo mode. And now the pentode and the triode are going to give me my distortion and my tone. So the pentode is going to be first in line. It's gonna feed the triode. I'm going to get the most affected distortion by turning the pentode up. So I'm going to use the pentode basically as like a big picture knob and then the triode is like a fine tuning knob. And you can also hear that the triode has a slightly different tone. It brings out some of the more aggressive upper mids. So sometimes that can be nice depending on what we're doing. And I think in this case, because we want that grit and that grime, that's gonna be a nice effect. Okay, so it's at this point now, I've gotten the, the triode up to where I want it. As the pentode starts to get into this like 68% range, that's where I'm starting to hear the kick kind of rounding out in a way that I don't like. We're losing our punch. So I've found kind of my upper bound. So I'm gonna back it down just a hair from there and it's still going to be losing too much punch, but this is, the, this is where I can get the tone pushed as far as I can without completely flattening the kick. And it actually sounds pretty good even as is. I might be able to get away with this in the overall context of the mix, but I wanna walk through the rest of the process here. So the next thing I do is I play with the calibration. I, sometimes setting it to dark kind of gives me more of what I'm looking for for low end. Sometimes keeping it on normal gives me what I'm looking for. And sometimes the calibration doesn't seem to make too much of a difference, but let's play with it. Let's see if there's one that we prefer over the other. So the dark definitely leans it over into the lower range a little bit. Like if I were to use the dark calibration, I'd probably also turn up the output just a little bit because we're losing some of the frequencies that are easier to hear.
Actually, I'm not going to lie. I, I kind of like that. I'm into that. So let's roll with it. I'm not going to overthink it, but I think either of them work. It's a subtle difference at the end of the day, and we're going to get results that are great no matter what choice is made. Okay, so now the density. I'm going to go the opposite direction. I'm going to over compress the signal with the density knob first, just so you can hear what happens when we start pushing up the compression. And you can hear the kick getting completely squared off now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in the opposite direction so that more of the kick comes through. It breathes a little bit better. So I'm going to copy this, I'm going to go over to my B setting, I'm going to paste it, and I'm going to set the density back to where it was at, and we'll just jump through the two. It's not the biggest difference. The biggest difference comes from getting those exact, dialing those settings in right at the beginning, finding that sweet spot, but you will hear a little bit of a difference. Let's go, let's go before after. You hear how when the density is at zero, it's a little flubby sounding, just a little bit. When I back off the density, I get that full push of the kick, and that's what's going to give me that really special sound where it has all this tone, but I'm not losing the punch, and that is the key. Now, let's say that I get it to that sweet spot, but I still want just like a little bit of clean, crisp leading edge, something that's just very, very sharp and fine to it, then that's where the parallel mix is gonna come in, and turning it down to maybe about 80% will usually allow just enough of that leading edge of the original kick drum to come through cleanly. Let's experiment with that. A lot of the times though I am using this at 100%. Yeah, so like like 80% is probably good. That allows for a little bit of that sharpness to come through. And now I'm going to A, B it without and then with. Let's level match it a little more tightly. I think we, we pushed up the level just a little bit. One more time, A, B. But I think even, even in spite of the difference in volume, I think just the energy and the aliveness of it was still apparent. Even from the time I just hit play, before even hearing the comparison, it was like, oh, something is missing. Actually, if I look at the peak meter, I am actually coming in at a lower volume. I'm level matching by ear. I think that that's more important than level matching by meter, but actually, it, at the end of the day, if I throw the limiter on to get the record as loud as I can, I've actually gained room to push my level up because my peaks are actually technically down, even though it does not sound that way, which is really kind of cool. Uh, the last thing, and this is just like a little bonus, and it works for this because we have this big grindy stereo bass that's here, I can actually push a little stereo width in there, a, a cool little knob to have. Okay, but now, what's the real test? How does it sound in the record? Let's push it through without it, and then let's hear it with, and I think the difference is gonna be pretty obvious. Sometimes it's also fun to play with the input knob a little bit once you hear it in the context of the mix because as things generally tend to be, uh, you can go a little further in the context of the mix than you would in solo. So I'm going to play around with the input knob a little bit too.
price. So the the big thing that's happening here is that the low end is starting to bloom out in this like really cohesive, cool way. And it, like I said in the beginning, it's forming this foundation where now I can make all of the other elements as big and as full and as fat as I want, and I will never, ever lose the weight and the power of that low end. All right, guys, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you dig what I'm doing here on this channel, you know the drill. You got to subscribe with the bell for notifications. And also, uh, is this the ugliest sweater you've ever seen or have you seen uglier? Let me know in the comments section below. All right, guys, you know the deal. We are musicians. Sound is our instrument. And I will catch you next time.